Hi, everyone. We are here today to talk about something that you really don't think about until it impacts you. And we're talking about cancer clinical trials and more specifically diversity in those cancer clinical trials. Dr. Maria Chagog from Lazarex Cancer Foundation. She is the Health Equity and Diversity Director. She joins us now to uh, to talk about the importance of diversity in clinical trials. And, and Maria, I know for people with cancer, clinical trials can be a lifeline or they can help extend a life, a person's life. Talk to me about the problem that you have seen over many years with clinical trials um, in the positions that you've had. Not everyone has access to clinical trials. It sounds like a great thing that you you really should be a part of this, but the problem is not everybody has access to it. You're exactly right, Laura. Really, the problem is it, before access, it's knowing about it. Not all doctors are informed the same on clinical trials, so then their patients aren't going to be informed. Likewise, when they are informed, how much are they informed and are they discouraging or encouraging a participation? So before we even get to the real access, finding a clinical trial that someone may qualify for, it's if they found out about it. Um, over the course of the last few months, even, I have spoken to so many people who are often given the death sentence, if you will, you know, get your fears in order prior to ever even thinking about a clinical trial. In fact, really only about 3% of cancer patients participate in clinical trial. Mm. So then of those, that 3%, the amount that are African-Americans and Latino Americans, which roughly make up about 13 and 16% of our population, it's less than five of those cancer and people with cancer that are African American, less than 5% of mm -hmm. the African Americans that have cancer participate in clinical trial. And that it's even really with Latino Americans. It's 1% with Latino Americans. Mm, that I mean, that that is just, uh, it really breaks down what the problem is and, and why, um, you know, access is so important. Talk about th those numbers a little bit more and why diversity is so important in clinical trials. Why do we need a more diverse population involved? So, you know, Laura, I have likened it into kind of like into using different types of gas in a car. So we have a new drug created. We believe it treats this kind of cancer. We test it out in a four cylinder car and it behaves this way. Then we test it out in a four cylinder hybrid. It's gonna react this way. We need to know how it reacts across all the different spectrums. It's the same with the clinical trial. It, we need to know how it behaves in each different type of person, race, and race and body type and all of that. So we know how it is. And also, so we can better predict or know what the side effects may be and weigh whether or not the side effects make it not worth the drug. But if we don't have a diverse population, then we only know how it works in one population. Okay. And so especially we... oftentimes when the, the, the cancer happens, occurs more in like in a minority population and they're not tested in it, then how do we know if it really is effective for that population who's getting the cancer? Mm -hmm. So we started off talking about the access piece. And, and Maria, can you talk about some of the obstacles that provide those barriers um, or that you know push up those barriers that, that keep people from being able to participate and, and stop the greater diversity that we need? I sure can. I'm going to run them down. So feel free to ask more or ask me to expand. Um, one is financial toxicity. And that kind of goes along with the, your, your insurance. Because oftentimes insurance won't support you in participating in a clinical trial, which then means the cost then can't, your not the cost of participating in the clinical trial, but your other tests. Has, is the cancer shrinking or coming back? Is, you know, all of those tests that, that go along with it. If your insurance doesn't cover those laboratory costs that the clinical trial does it, then it starts to get, then, then the cost of actually receiving this treatment goes up. And then there's also the financial toxicity of what happens if the clinical trial isn't in your neighborhood or backyard. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then now you have to worry about travel and, you know, what's happening in your home who's going to take care of the kids or the grandparents or whatever. So then there's all these additional financial toxicity. You're taking off from work. 
Mm -hmm. How is that money repaid? All of those things then make it really hard sometimes financially to participate yeah. in clinical trials. That's when you find out about one, which is the first thing I said. If you don't find out, you can't participate. Yeah. Then once you do find out, there's always that trust or skepticism. I can't tell you how many times I hear, well, I don't want to be anybody's guinea pig. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a test threat because there is a preconceived notion that you know, you, if you choose to participate in a clinical trial, you might not get any drug. The fact is with cancer clinical trials, you will either get the new drug that's believed to work better than the current best gold standard of drug, or you're going to get the gold standard of drug. It's never going to be with cancer clinical trials that you're going to get a placebo. It's yeah. going to be either you're getting gold standard or the new drug. That's and so that goes into the lack of information. Exactly. And a lot of people just don't know, just... <laughs> So, so talk to me about what Lazarex is doing to change this. What is what is the mission and what are some of the efforts that you're making to create this change? That's, thanks. So over the past 17 years, Lazarex has ha helped almost 12,000 patients. And what we mean by helping is we've helped them identify clinical trials they may participate, that they can participate in. And then also we've provided reimbursement for travel for them and a care advocate for them to go and participate in the clinical trial. So what that looks like is somebody who's participating in a clinical trial who may have to travel on average for Lazarus patients, we found that they, they travel about 544 miles one way mm -hmm. to get to a clinical trial. That can be really both physically and costly. So we may help with um, reimbursement or in other ways for the person to get to the trial and then, um, then them and a caregiver. Because when you have cancer, we have to remember that these are people who have cancer. They're not going to be at their best. So they really need a care advocate or some people say caregiver to go with them to help make sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. And it lowers anxiety and all of those things. So that's, that's the so, first that's thing. Yeah, that's so important. And I understand that there are, there are other programs like the IMPACT program that allows for pe patients to learn about it at, at the hospital, in the hospital setting, in the in, um, and, and, and make those decisions to get involved immediately. That's the knowledge barrier. And then there are legislative um, efforts that Lazarex is making. Talk to me about the Cancer Wellness Hub, because I know that that's something that you're closely involved in. Just give me a brief synopsis of- sure, The Cancer Wellness that. Hub is- is our community outreach hub, is our community outreach arm of the program. So what we found was exactly what I said before, people, especially in low income or else that are on um, some of the government, Medicare, Medicaid um, funding streams for insurance, mm -hmm. they simply aren't informed about clinical trials. And oftentimes if they're low income, they also don't have access to screening, testing, and they off don't even know what to get screened or test. You know, the numbers change all the time. You know, if you think about it, I'm sure you've been through it. Like, what age do I get my, my colonoscopy? Mm -hmm. Is it 40? Is it 50? Is it 45? What determines what age I get it? What determines how often I get it? So there's a lot of just kind of confusion about not only how to prevent cancer, but how to screen for cancer, different cancers, and then also where you go to get them. So the hub is a community outreach arm in several, usually in our lower income underserved communities that does active um, outreach into the community. It's both linguistically matched. So if we're in a Korean um, community, we're going to have people who speak Korean. If we're in a Latino community, we're going to have people who speak Spanish. So to reduce the anxiety about having to talk to somebody about a disease that kind of has, not kind of, about a disease that has a stigma to it. People still say, oh, she has cancer. You know, it's still, you know, mentioned in these kind of hushed tones, especially if we're talking about in the reproductive or organs for men or women, um, they're, they're not talked about openly and often. So we go into those communities and really it's a hub. We want people to travel through to get the information they need to get to care, to get to screening, to get to post care, to get to whatever, so that they can, you know, help along their cancer journey. If, we, if you think of that, everyone has a cancer journey. Yeah, very interesting. Well, Maria Chagog, um, I, I I just appreciate so much all of the information because there are so many people who don't understand the importance of diversity in clinical trials. Lazarex Cancer, Cancer Foundation is doing so much to help try to overcome a lot of these barriers and um, and help patients get 
where they need to be when they need to be there. So thank you so much for your input. I appreciate it. You're most welcome.